This is the Dairy Brothers Tribecast, a podcast for diehard Cleveland Indians fans. Presented to you by WaitingForNextYear.com. Now, here are the hosts, Matt and Todd Derry. Wow, we're back. It seems like we're doing uh, more shows with no baseball than with baseball. Matt and Todd Derry with you. It is the Derry Brothers a Tribe Cast here on a late April sunny afternoon. Matt and Todd with you, brought to you by our friends at WaitingForNextYear.com. That's where you find the podcast and by the Center for Advanced Dentistry. And Todd, big news after last week's a chicken finger topic. New sponsor today. This is very exciting. Yes, yes. Uh, do If we want to get right into it, we can. Or do you want to go and then talk about our new sponsor? What well, do you think? I think you should at least tease it and tell everybody who it is. Well, well to those who listened last week, we sang the praises of Raising Canes, which is you know relatively new here in Northeast Ohio, but obviously a household name and chicken game, but... They have agreed to come come aboard as one of our great subscribers, as Gary D used to say. And uh, we thank them, and we'll talk about them a little bit later. But yes, Raising Cane, the best chicken fingers going, and that great dipping sauce going. They're uh, now a part of the podcast. So How about we welcome that? Them. So uh, I, I don't want to get too deep into the story here, but this is, uh, you know, we, we, we've we got to reach. Once, once Cleveland Plain Dealers said we were one of the best podcasts, and... <laughs> You know, I mean, uh, what should I talk about now? Culver's is ice cream. What should we? What should we do that? Let, let, let's let's be honest. The real reason Raising Canes has, has, has come aboard is because of you. Nobody drives this show like you. Let's be honest. Oh come on! I don't know. I don't know why we had to get on the chicken thing. I mean, I I, I was I was intrigued and into it. So it got us a sponsor. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> man, man, top I, five I with that. top five pizza places. Let's talk some. Uh, <laughs> But uh, what's going on, man? What you know? I, you sent me this uh, Jeff Passan story, which I haven't read yet. I'll be honest; my show prep uh, game is not not very high. Uh, it, it does sound like maybe July fourth for opening day. There, there, it seems like baseball people are telling baseball writers that there will be games played here. You know, they want. I think, and and we talked about this in the last pod, but I think. That Major League Baseball, well, first of all, I, everyone knows that Major League Baseball has now become a distant third behind the NFL and the NBA in the, the major sports here in America in terms of, you know, eyeballs and, and, and popularity. Shit, shit, it might be behind NASCAR. Yeah. The left turn circuit, as <laughs> Jerome used to call it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, rack him, rack him. <laughs> No, but I think they see a real opportunity because, as, as we discussed, whoever, whichever one of these major sports is first and has live games on TV is going to get insane eyeballs. Look at what the NFL draft did this weekend. I mean, I, I, I don't know about you, but I watched more NFL draft this weekend than I've ever watched ever in my life. I watched the entire first round. I watched a lot of Friday night as well. At least I had on the background. And even Saturday afternoon, you know, the weather was bad here. And even then, uh, I, I, uh, you know, was, was dialed in Saturday, had it on. I was like, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh round. There's nothing else going on. And then look at the ratings for the last dance, uh, on ESPN, the, the Michael Jordan documentary. I am glued to that thing. I watched it twice. I watched it again last night. It's Ugh. so good. I, I, can't, I mean, it is. And I got to be honest. Saturday, this past Sunday, episodes three and four, I, I you know, I, I kind of had a, a local angle twice. You know, I have the Cleveland angle because you and I were at shot one, shot two. Heck, at junior high school, I was at the 69 point game uh, at, at Richfield Coliseum during the week special, March of 1990, or 1991. So. Um, you know, or ninety, excuse me. It's it's crazy, and and then the, the Detroit angle because I live here, so it's it's been good TV. I got to be honest. You were forming two lanes, but you know, you and I were forming two lanes this weekend. It was it was like old school <laughs> for those that don't remember and they're too young to remember because I'm sure there's a lot of you out there. And there and, was, and it's fantastic. Well, it's fantastic that LeBron and the Cavs won a championship downtown and all that, but. Real Cavs basketball is Richfield Coliseum, and, and that's it. Case closed. Next. Amen. And you and I, you know, it's funny. When we went to go pick up the puppy, you know, we, we drove to, you know, just outside of Columbus, and we passed 
where the Coliseum was out in Richfield. And every time we've ever passed it with the kids, I, I tell the same story, and they're like, yeah, we know, Dad, form two lanes. <laughs> you know, Richfield, you, Penin- you, Richfield Peninsula, 303. That's right, Richfield Peninsula exit. And you look out there now, and it's just that empty field, and it's so bizarre that they played out there, but if you think about it, it was actually, I mean, you, you know, now it, it's, you know, nobody's building stadiums like that or, or arenas like that, you know, way out in, in the middle of nowhere. And if they did, they would build a city around it, kind of like what, you know, when, when Arizona, car, the, the you know, built that dome out in uh, Glendale. And that now Glendale's got like, you know, restaurants and hotels and bars and it's like a city. Richfield, it was the Tavern of Richfield, Mel and Susie Rose and... Uh, and their fine and staff. Else? Yeah, and they're fine staff. Bun, and they're the bun staff. stuffers. That was inside the arena. <laughs> bun, bun I don't. Stuffers. I don't know any. I don't know anything else off that exit. I mean, there's probably but some sort of. There was nothing there. It's so, probably some but, sort of Wendy's or something. But God, that place used to rock, man. We had such a great time. Uh, we. This was back when the Cavs were to, to me and you. Like the Indians have always been number one for us. I mean, Dad was always the baseball first guy, and he he pushed that on us. But, but. Uh, you know, we we were right there. The Cavs were pretty equal with the with the Indians and the Browns for us. No and doubt, no had, no doubt. You know, we were lucky enough to where you know in, in the heyday when when the, the Dalton was was around in the family business and in the in the seventies and eighties, and we had tickets and we went to as many Cavs games, but Cleveland Force games we used to go to all the time too. The you want you want to talk about rock? Dude, when Darth when Darth Vader came out for the introductions, that place was up up for grabs. First of all, was that not the coolest thing ever, ever? Right? I mean, I thought it was so cool. Well, yeah, they, we, they, they, they turned the lights off. The smoke and the and the uh, it was like um, silver, uh, like whatever that was. That they used to that Darth Vader came out. Man, that was cool. I love that. We used to love that. Who's your favorite? Uh, real quick, give me your favorite Cleveland Forest player. Uh, I mean, you know, Keith Furphy was really good. Chris Sobieski in goal, Bernie James. I mean, they, they had all sorts Bern- of good players. Are you talking about Bernie James? That's right. 20? Oh, yeah. Wasn't he the greatest shot blocker in the MISL? What about the, Nan- <laughs> what about the Nanchoff brothers? <laughs> what about number 12? Kai Hoskivy. You know, I would say Kai Hoskivy was our favorite because we went to Force sure. uh, Soccer Camp. Uh, I think at yes, the U.S. Did. at the U.S. Upper Campus. Uh, Is that where it was? I think it was. Okay. Right? And uh, Kai Hoskivy couldn't have been nicer. I mean, they all were great. Yeah. They all were cool. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you who else was a coach of ours and who was your boy and he loved you was Vic Davidson. That's right. That was your guy. Yeah, he was good. What about the Chris Chris McCarroll and Chris Sobieski? We had two Chris's in goal. Uh, Otto Orff was in goal, wasn't he? At one point, was that and late? He, was that was late, late stages? He was late. PJ Johns was before him, I believe. I'll never forget one time when I was working at. Uh, mm-hmm. I think I was. Right at, I think I was. At, I think I was at WHK in '95 or '96, and Hector Marinero just called in, and I'm like, Hector Marinero. Thought it was the coolest thing ever. Yeah, well, he he was like the, the Cleveland Crunch all time legend. We're, we're talking, old, old time, old time force games were fun, but oh yeah, yeah. But, but how we got on this topic, I don't know. But it the, was, Coliseum, <laughs> the Coliseum, the Coliseum, oh, the Coliseum. So yeah, I just the Coliseum just rocks. But anyways, you know, we, we were talking about the passing plan, and 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 what he was saying. And so my the point of what, what I was trying to make was. Whoever's getting the first baseball knows that they got to do something. Yep. And I think if they can get out there first, and even if there's no fans in the stands, and they got games on every night, I mean, you know, you're. I mean, you and I love baseball, so we'll watch. Well, and, and think I, about I, this: their TV deal with ESPN. So if they have every Monday and Wednesday night for ESPN, well, there's games that have to be made up. So now, like you said, if they can start in July and be the only game going. Because maybe the NBA gets canceled, maybe the NHL. Not that anybody watches hockey, um, but still, then you would have maybe ESPN almost like every night have a different game, have a, have a double header. Why not? I mean, they probably would. They probably that would be would have to. unheard of and for no, the MLB to have every single night national games on. And yeah, because there, if there's nothing else to show, plus it's probably going to be one of these situations, you know, where it's going to be two games or four games in a stadium, you know, in a day. 
if, if they're going to end up doing this, they're going to do these pods. I mean, it sounded like in the past and piece on ESPN.com, it sounded to me like, you know, there's several different plans, but it sounds like it's going to be like teams are going to be potted and it's almost going to be like two game round robin series going on, you know, for like 10 games and then they kind of move around. I, I thought the most interesting, and, and again, you know, you and I are kind of baseball. I, I would say you and I are both baseball purists. Would you agree with me on that in terms of, you know, keeping the, you know, the rules and, and not getting too hokey with, with rules and stuff? Would you, would you agree with me on that? Oh yeah. Yeah. They, they, they play okay. so, they play so fine. Don't you agree? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I do. But, but in this instance, for one season, throw everything out of the mix, except for it's got to be a nine inning game. Throw everything out of the mix. And if it's got to be, you know, this one of the ideas in the piece was like, kind of like almost like at the end of the season would be like an all 32 team tournament to kind of divide, to, to make this year's World Series. I think that would be kind of sweet if you were like, okay. It's a 60 game tournament where, you know, you're playing, you know, whatever it was. And like the best, it was, it was kind of like, I can't remember specifically, but it was something to the effect of, you know, there's this pod and there's these 10 teams in this pod. And whoever comes out of that 10 teams with the two best records then moves to the next round and moves to the next pod. I think that would be kind of cool. And it makes these games all mean something because, you know, listen, you and I both understand that, yes, there's 162 games and it's a marathon, not a sprint, but every one of these games counts the same, where, you know, when the Indians were throwing away games last year with the more, the more off statements, you know, garbage, and we would say, yep, that's going to come back and haunt us because these games in September, while they mean so much, it's also the same one game as it does in April. Every one of those games is going to well, feel like but, a playoff but, game. But the problem is if you do this tournament – and then let's say the Detroit Tigers or you know the the the, the San Francisco Giants, you know, these teams that don't belong get hot for like a so week. Yeah, that's lame. You got to. I, I I think you have it's to one take. Year. Who cares? I know, but yeah, but you have to take into consideration. You you got to reward, and I understand you would seed it a certain way. So if you play this shortened season and get to this tournament, the tournament would be seeded based on the regular season, but I just don't want to turn this into like, you know, Horizon League basketball where Wright State dominates the regular season and plays in some meaningless tournament at the end and loses. Now, I know that it's a little bit different, but they're still playing for the same type of thing. Do you see what I'm saying? To me, yeah, the but... teams that do well in the regular season and deserve it should get a bye, should get something. The teams that suck, goodbye, season's over. I, I, I wouldn't want everybody involved in this tournament. I think that would be lame. Okay, now let me go the other way and say that I'm treating this like it's the NCAA tournament, okay? You brought up the Horizon League tournament. Let's say this is an open NCAA tournament, essentially, and UMBC one time beat Virginia, you know, and, and that happened, and it was it was an incredible thing. But it was also one game. It's not going to be the Yankees play the Tigers and the Tiger one game to decide who goes on. It's going to be a cumulative effect. These are all going to be series. So even if a team gets hot and wins two out of three, are they really going to? Are the Tigers really going to go? Okay, we beat the Indians two out of, three, and then there's another three game series. And then they beat uh, the Rays two out of three, and then they beat the Indians two out of three. That's never going to happen. And well, whoever wins this championship, it's still going to be an asterisk. But still, I I think having every you can't if you leave certain teams out. It's just, it, it, I, I don't know. I think every it, listen. There's a long way to go. They got to come up with this plan. But I kind of like having everybody involved. But if, it, but, but again, the seeding would be the key. And there is no home field advantage in these games, obviously, because it's going to be probably no fans in the stands. And let's say it's, you know, at the new Texas Dome, it's for one, and Arizona for one, and you know, what, whatever it might be. I, I don't know. I just, I, I, to me, again. All bets are off. I just want to see baseball, so I couldn't care less who, what's fair and what's not. Is it fair? Here, let me let me tell you, say, ask you this: Is it fair that the Yankees have the two hundred twenty million dollar payroll every year? No, no, you, no, I know, but but now but now you're 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 comparing, you know, the, the, that's apples and oranges a little bit. I, I do get it. That's the field that it's you know that that the, 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 the that's the playing field that baseball's had. And you're right, there's haves and have-nots. And yes, I think it would make it more fun and exciting. And you're right, 2020, you throw this out. 
But but still, once the games start, we want our team to win. And if our team makes a run, we're not going to tell people, no, we're not going to apologize for it. This is how the season was played, and everybody was on, you know, equal playing field in terms of how the, 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 the game was the games were set up. Is everybody on an equal playing field all the time when it comes to how the franchises are set up and, and the rules? Of course not. Because you're right, the Dodgers and Yankees would yeah. just play in this whole thing and everybody else would sit out. I, I'm with you. I want some baseball, but I also want, if you're going to play the season, don't at the end of October, November, whenever they get to the playoffs, go, oh, everybody's in the playoffs. That I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Yeah, and I think that was just one of the options uh, that I didn't mind as much as you did, obviously. But I, I do think, though, that if the ultimate plan would end up being there would be, you know, a you know, 70, 80 game season and then an extended playoff, but not, I, I mean, ultimately, I think it would be like instead of having one wild card team, you know, uh, you know, one wild card team and three division winners. It would probably be more like you know three wild card teams and division winners, or they might not have divisions at all, and they may just go um, you know eight teams in each league. I mean that that's you know sixteen teams in the playoffs. I mean I think there's going to be there's the going to be complaining, and you know if the Indians were put, and I, I remember that original plan, the Indians were going to be in some division in Arizona with the Dodgers and right. and White Sox, and it's like oh you know. How come the Yankees division so easy or whatever? I don't remember what it looked like. That was weeks ago. But you're right. We're just we're dying for Let's something here. Yeah, exactly. The fact Let's that in Detroit, baseball. the fact that in Detroit right now, all anybody wants to talk about is Isaiah Thomas and Michael Jordan not shaking hands thirty years ago, and it's becoming heated. Should tell you that we're just we're grasping for anything right now. <laughs> anything. People are talking about that in Cleveland and in you know, Los Angeles and in Boston and in New York. I mean, it's a, that, that's a topic for everybody. So yes, we are desperate for anything. I mean, it, I listen, we're so desperate for stuff. I watched the bug game from 2007 game two of the ALDS start to finish mm. the other night. How about that? Who was the losing? Was the losing pitcher in game two, Luis Viscaino? Is that right? Yes, it was. Yeah, I do yes, remember that. Was. I do remember you that. Know, I'll tell you, and, and we'll segue into into that game. Before we segue into that game, I do want to talk about our great new sponsor, Raising Cane's, the greatest chicken fingers that you'll ever eat. You know, uh, I, I got to tell you, you know, after we had a nice conversation and they, they were so nice to, you know, offer up a sponsorship, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about what's going on and what they're doing here in, in the state of Ohio. So... You know, after we had that conversation, they were nice enough to give us, hooked us up with some free combo, uh, some box combos. Let's go. Because, yeah, which is really nice because they're, they're really doing a lot to support Ohio sports. So through their partnership with the OHSAA, they're hosting a special fundraiser this Thursday, April 30th, to benefit student-athletes. If you drive through any Raising Cane's Ohio location on Thursday, April 30th, from 4 to close... There's a 15% of what you, um, 15% of the sales are going to go to the OHSAA to help fund student athletes scholarships and other important programs. So if you want, go ahead, check them out and check out their support of high school athletes on Twitter at Raising Canes Ohio, O O H. So that's Raising Canes C A N E S O H uh, on Twitter. They got some really fun shout outs um, from, from some familiar faces on there you're in love. And if you want to show some support, one of the things they're doing is you throw your best throwback sports picture on Twitter with the hashtag one love one team. And those are the number one love one team. Uh, you'll, you'll check it out. It's, it's really cool. Um, I, <laughs> I may or may not, uh, I'm trying to find one to throw up there of my, uh, my greatness is the tenth man on the worst high school basketball team in the state of Ohio. Oh no, that's right. That's right. Coached by Max Vermillion, your Orange Lions. <laughs> also, a member of that team was the great, legendary Twitter sports legend Cleve T. A. Uh, uh, was also on that team, and the great Doctor Borland, also a member of that team. We were so bad. We were zero and twenty-one, but we still got to be a part of the OHSAA tournament. Might I add? And we lost to the Benedictine, uh, uh, what were they, Benedictine something, I can't remember their names, but uh, on that team was the great Eugene Freeman and f- former NFL long snapper Joe Zelenka. <laughs> <laughs> what the 
now. Where are you going? Where are you going with this? Oh my god. Well, I what love I was it. Say was I, there are photos of me flying around with my you got to do my it. afro uh you know the backup uh backup that that, the that fro that it, it, the longer this uh, pandemic goes that that fro might come back. You should see it now. Oh my god. It is you know normally I get my hair cut every 3 weeks and I'm on week I haven't got okay Andrew's bar mitzvah was on the 29th of February. That was the last time I got a haircut, and we're taping it. Okay, so it's been two months. Wow. The 28th. How we're about that? This. Again, uh, yeah. best throwback sports picture on Twitter. Use the hashtag. Hashtag one love one, love, one, team. one team. At Raising Canes OH on Twitter, and again, we thank them. Uh, you know, for their support of Ohio high school athletics, and again. Check them out uh, on the 30th from 4 to close, and 15% of their sales will go to the OHSAA for scholarships and other high school sports programming. So check them out. You'll never eat better chicken fingers, better dipping sauce in the state of Ohio, and uh, northern Kentucky as well. That's right. And with Raising Cane's, I mean, and one thing we know about Raising Cane's, keep the faith. Great, Great food. Great food. Uh, well played. Matt and Todd with you. It is another uh, rousing edition of the Dairy Brothers uh, Tribe Cast talking all things uh, Tribe. You wanted to get into the uh, Midge game a little bit, so that was on uh, STO the other night. Huh? I, you know, I, I love seeing some of the videos. I love seeing some of the interviews that, that were done about that game with, with Travis Hafner and, and, and even Eric Wedge. I even sent a tweet. Yeah. I sent a tweet to Eric Wedge just thanking him. Because I have a serious man crush on him. He's uh, he's one of my favorites. He's I'm like a big Rick Carlisle slappy. Uh, Wedge is right up there, man. That managing job in 07 is just a thing of beauty. Nobody loved the grinder quite like you did. You were really in the tank for that guy. And he did a great job, no doubt. And I will say this, though, about him. And, you know, you, you look at things differently, obviously, now. And, like, back in 2007, I was still okay with sacrifice bunts. They bunted in this game, the Indians, I think six or seven times. Well, that's how we scored our first run. I, I, if I recall, uh, Melky Cabrera had a solo homer yes, off of did. Carmona. It was one nothing. We scored on, like, Grady got on, got moved over by somebody. I don't remember who bunted him over. And then he, that was like a wild pitch and a sack fly or something. I mean, it wasn't even a hit, really. If I recall, it that's how we got It was a wild got... pitch. Victor, Victor, he was on third. Uh, and Vic, uh, the, Victor was up, and there was the wild pitch. I believe it was uh, John moved him over. Or no, 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 it was his Drubal. I'm sorry. It was yeah, his Drubal bunted. Yeah. Yep. So what's funny about this is there are so many things that were interesting to me about this game. Several things. Number one, is Drubal Cabrera what people I, – I, I think when if you were watching this game back – you forgot that his Drupal played 45 regular season games with the Indians that year. He came, yeah, up, came out of nowhere. And, and, and came out of nowhere, played awesome second base, and batted, was batting second. <laughs> they just threw him in there. And, but he only played, you forget because he was on the Indians for so long, and then he eventually took over shortstop when Peralta moved on. But he only played 45 games, and they really had him, you know, as an important part of, of the team, which I, I thought was pretty cool. Well, didn't we, also, didn't we just bag the whole Josh Barfield thing? Isn't that what it was? Yes, great call. Josh Barfield was the starting second baseman most of that season, and he, he really went into the tank. I saw him on the bench there. I don't even think he made the postseason roster. I'll tell you another thing I totally forgot about during that game. I thought the Delucci Michaels platoon was 08. Michaels was starting in that game because to face Andy Pettit. Ah, uh, yes. And it was, and it, it was uh, yeah, J. Mike. Had, J. Mike had a, had a leadoff double. But what was, uh, what was interesting, another interesting thing was, in the first six innings, the Indians had their leadoff man on five times and did not score. <laughs> Which I completely for, you know, you for The only thing we ever remember about the game was, oh, yeah, uh, Jabba had bugs crawling all over his neck, and the midges showed up, and the Yankees were spraying bug spray all over themselves. And I think one of the interviews, it was either Jensen Lewis or Garko said, we knew, they told us, our training staff and our people were like, don't spray yourself with bug spray. This stuff's attracted to the bugs. But we didn't tell that to the Yankees, and they were spraying bug spray all over themselves. <laughs> Which well, was uh, Garko, Garko looks like he's in good shape. I saw I saw some of those interviews. It was, uh... I think what a, what, a, what, a, what a lovable guy. Yeah. I think he's a college coach, maybe. Does I think he sound? just I think he just got a big league job. As he's on somebody's staff, I am pretty sure. Yeah. It might be the Angels. 
I don't know. That. Yeah, look that up. I, I love seeing. I mean, I, you know, you and I were at game one of that series. Um, yes, we were. We were not at game two, but we were at game one. Johnny Damon, the like first pitch of the game, just crushed one. Uh, yeah, I like to talk about Johnny Damon. <laughs> 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 yes, he was hired on January sixth uh, as an assistant hitting coach for the Angels. By the Angels. Oh man, I knew I saw that somewhere, but uh, yeah, I think we blew them out in game one and. They brought Chin Ming Wong back for Game Four. What a joke that was! I mean, we we had his number that whole series, whole series, just blistered. So, so just well, what? Yes, we did. So just watching that whole game, the first time Kenny Loft, well, every time Kenny Loft and came to the plate, the crowd for Kenny. You know, you forget about the fact that he came back. I mean, I don't forget it, but like he was gone for like a decade essentially, and he came back, and the love for him was next level when he came back. But every time he came to the plate, it was like rock star crowd reaction. People just loved him. And he he was, I think he had, I know he got, he was he had hits in his first two at-bats in that game, but he just kept getting on. He was on second, he got picked off by Pettit to end the inning one, one of the time one in, in the first six innings. Andy Pettit, by the way, showing a lot of emotion in that game. And I, I know, oh, he's the bulldog, and you know, Andy Pettit, da 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 I forgot how annoying he was when we watched that game. Well, he always he always ate us alive. I mean, he was a, he was one of those, you know, you know, we couldn't hit the lefty to begin with, and then here's Pettit, and he's changing speeds, and that, that guy was part of the core four. Oh, yeah, they're, they're not the real core four as as we know here in Cleveland. The core four is uh, whoever is the the original core four of Cleveland is um, Jason Trusnick, Nick Sorensen. Um, um, Bubba Ventrone and, uh, <laughs> and um, oh my God, the linebacker. Oh my God, I'm drawing a blank. Who's the linebacker? I can't remember who it was, but our racist usher said something like, oh yeah, you want to know why he's good? Because he's white. I swear to God, it was the most bizarre thing ever. Ask oh, Jeremy, was, Ray, Ray, Ray Ventrone. I'll, I'll come up with it. But anyways, um, I digress. But yeah, the, the love for Kenny was so great and his return, being back and that's what another thing that made that 017 special was his return. You know? Incredible. He was 40. Never played again. That was it? That was it. He had some that random st- he had some random stops. I remember when he was on the Cubs. I think he was on the Cubs in the playoffs. I I'm gonna look this up right now to see how many teams he was he was uh, uh he was on. I know he was on the Dodgers. I know he played for the Yankees. That was the other thing I was watching this game with the Yankees. Like they had Bobby Abreu. Like they had, the Yankees had Everybody, right at some point, Bobby and Abreu. Yeah, was, Bobby Abreu had a home run off of Borowski to cut it to six four in Game Four. It was like, oh, I mean, just like crushed it. And then Posada hit that ball foul, and you're like, geez, this guy's throwing BP. Like we're trying to close this series out with a guy throwing like eighty miles an hour. Kenny uh, Lofton played seventeen years in the majors. All right, let me see okay. how. Let me see how I do here. Uh, okay, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you go and see if you can go in order of his team. Well, I don't know if I can go in order, really but I mean, all right. Well, here, guess Houston. Yes, Houston. Us. First. Yes. Atlanta. Yes. Uh, Chicago Cubs. That was not next, but he did play for the Cubs in in 2003. Texas. He left Cleveland the second time around in 01 at age 34. Uh, yeah. I mean, well, d- did he go to Texas? Texas. He was on Texas in '07 before the Indians. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so you're you're hot. Yankees. Mm-hmm. He was on the Yankees in '04. Dodgers, you said. The Dodgers '06. Uh, I'm trying to think of you other... a one year, a lot of one year stints here for Kenny. Uh, he must have been a real prick. <laughs> I mean, with the amount of moving he did for the, for he, the he never he never played for the Mets. No, he did not play for the Mets. Um, do, 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 do. Who am I thinking of? Oh man! So here in O two he played for two teams. In O three he played for two teams. And these in are O2, two I didn't mention. I haven't mentioned. You have not mentioned the White Sox. The Cubs. He played for two teams in 03, the Cubs and, and another team. What about he the White Sox? The White, yes, White Sox in 02. Yeah. And then he was traded at the deadline to another playoff contender. Oh, God. Which I do not remember him playing on this team at all. The Cardinals? No. 
The Giants. He was on the Giants. Correct. San Francisco Giants. Oh, okay. oh gosh. So who am I? Who am I forgetting? O three started the year as a Pittsburgh Pirate. What? And was yes. No played way. 84, played eighty four games with the Pirates in O three, and then was traded to the Cubs in O four. He played uh, for the Yankees, only eighty three games. In in, in O five. Phillies, 110 games. 06, Dodgers, 129 games. 07, 84 in Texas, 52 in Cleveland. Then he retired. See, that might actually hurt his Hall of Fame stature. Probably Uh, does. He he was just a vagabond at the end. My gosh. He he was in Cleveland from 92 to 97 to 96, and then 98 to 01. But then starting in 02, he played for... White Sox and Giants, that's two. Pirates and and Cubs, that's four. Yankees is five. Phillies is six. Dodgers is seven. (laughs) Texas is eight. And Cleveland was nine. So nine teams in his last... Wow. Nine teams in his last five years. Man, oh man. That's crazy. That's Edwin Jackson shit right there. But he can still do it. Oh, yeah. No question. Hit 296 with a 781 OPS as, as we, a 30-year-old. When, 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 when the, in 07, yeah. when the Indians played the Tigers, they came in in September. Kenny was you know just getting on the team. And I, I, told, I told my wife, we weren't married at the time, but I'm like, we're going. And we didn't have tickets, nothing. We sat like second row from the top. Between home and third, just I had to see Lofton one last time in person. I didn't know, you know, if we were going to win the division, what was going to happen, if I'd ever get to come home and see him. It was so cool. So cool. Because he was in great shape. And from the upper deck, it looked like Kenny of old. You know, obviously, you look, you watch on TV, you see he's gotten older, but man, it was he in awesome well, shape. He, he, he certainly had plenty of speed, even though Skinner held him up. Oh, God. Here we go. I know. I can't listen. I'll never get over it. But in the mean, in the meantime, in that game, the Midge game. In, the, in, the, in, in that bug game, Johnny, I mean, like, you, you forget, like, the little things, like, they bring in Jabba. And you, what, what I didn't remember was Jabba, you remember how great Jabba was? Oh, was yeah, seven? so high. Oh, Nobody so hyped, was hyped, him. hyped. Oh, like super hype, but when they brought him up, like nobody could touch him. He was unreal, and he was pitching the eighth in front of Rivera. He was only 21 years old, but what I didn't remember, and I had looked up, he had only pitched in 19 games. So it's not like he was up all year. He pitched 19 games before the playoffs. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and then everybody thought at that point after, and you know, that he was going to be the next Yankee great. He was eventually going to become the closer. He ended up pitching in the majors for almost 10 years, but he was never great again. He really wasn't. I mean, he, you know, I. It, it, what's funny is there was an interview that he gave. Uh, Sto, I believe, had it on their um, uh, Twitter feed because he was one of the interviews, and they asked him about, you know, it was from when he was on the Indians for the cup of coffee he spent on the Indians that year. And he was not bad, by the way, when he was on the Indians, and they cut him when he got hurt. But they asked him about it, and he said he he admitted he was totally rattled by it. He had never seen anything like that in his life. And just that picture that nobody will ever be able to get out of their head was him, like, peering in, and he's got those bugs just... I mean, I imagine that game... If that happened in 2020 in the playoffs, how it would be dicey. Oh yeah, for to, sure. Right? I mean, and, and here's the, and the other thing too is is the you mentioned Carmona before. I mean, talk about a rise out of nowhere, and then just talk about a serious just drop, like just you know got to the top and then just crashed. I mean, poor Fausto, man. He was so good that season too. I mean. You forget about how great he was. You know, that's when people actually still care about wins. He won 19 games. But he, in that game, he had only allowed two hits through nine innings against the Yankees. Right. And he was not faced by the bugs at all. And no. he, was, he was under 100 pitches, too, in those nine innings, which was... And he was sweating incredible. through that dark blue jersey. Sweating. You know, uh, uh, they, the announcers for that game were... It was uh, your boy, Cheesy Cheerleader Chip. And um, Tony Gwynn. That was a TBS game, if I recall, right? Chip Carey and them. No, I think it was it was Fo- it was Fox National. Oh, okay. Yeah, but uh, was the night was before fun. Game One? Because I I remember yes. watching the Hafner hit. Was yeah, I, we were not at the game. I was with my kids. I was. Uh, I, that, that's. But I. But I. We were at the game the night before. 
You came so, in for game one. I must have driven. That was a lot of driving, but I, it was. I just. You, I remember yeah. when Hafner made. You know, that was awesome. What a win! Sting, what a win! Stinging line drive, especially with the amount of runners the Indians had uh, had left on base. It was like it was. You know, they left fourteen guys on base, and they were two for eighteen with runners in scoring position. <laughs> yeah. It was crazy. And uh, another unsung hero of that, and the guy whose season was incredible that year, Rafael Perez pitched two scoreless after the nine innings of of, uh, of uh, Fausto. And he was, yeah, the slider of death. Remember how great he was. Oh, man, was so, that good. Just an under, you know, underappreciated group that, unfortunately, it was a one-hit wonder. You know, I mean, that the, the yeah. whole thing. Not that Betancourt and Perez weren't, but that, but just oh seven, just everything came into place. It was a masterful job by Wedge, and it was you know mixing and matching, and you know Trot Nixon, and it's crazy, crazy, crazy group, but a, a fun team to watch for sure. No doubt, and you know you you look at at the line. I'm looking at the lineup from that day, and it, it it's not exactly Murderer's Row here. Okay, Grady Sizemore. Let's talk about Grady for a second. You know, he made a diving catch that saved a run to end, I believe it was like the sixth and the seventh inning, and it was vintage Grady, you know, running sp- dead sprints, you know, across to his right, diving catch, you know, with with, with the right-handed glove because he was left-handed. He was one of the – he was a absolute superstar in the making, and just – his body just completely fell apart. And the 05 was really – you know, his I believe 05 was like the peak of Grady, right? Like Grady Mania here at least. Or 07, I mean. Grady's, like Grady's Grady ladies. Mania. That's right. But you remember how great he was? Oh, yeah. Just sad that he fell apart the way he did because he was, he was a superstar. And then the Indians, remember, the, I don't remember which year it was, they gave him the... They gave him five million dollars, and he didn't play one. And, and when they gave it to him, I was like, "Yeah, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. He won't play one game." And sure enough, he didn't. But it was Grady leading off. Is Drubal hitting second, who had only played in forty-five games? Hafner in 07 was not nearly as good. Or in, in 07, remember, 06 was his great year. Victor, who was a stud, but then the bottom it was Garco, Peralta, forty-year-old Kenny. Jason Michaels and Casey Blake was was the starting lineup that day. Wow. Yeah. You forget about Casey Blake until we get to the next series. <laughs> I'll never forget we play the Yankees in game three, and it was, you know, your typical up 2-0, got to go back to the Bronx. Uh, I believe it was Westbrook was pitching, you know, and the Yankees had his number, and we lose, but I really wanted that game because I could watch that game because game four was the Pistons preseason opener. And remember, I'm working for the team doing pre-half and post-game on the radio. So it's like, how, I can't miss that, right? So courtside, you know, I made sure that we had a t- uh, one of the mini TVs that was supposed to be a stat monitor or a replay monitor for our radio team, Mark Champion, Mahorn, me and Albert, like, um, I had the game on. But, like, I'm supposed to do a post-game show upstairs afterwards? Like, <laughs> it was ridiculous. Rem- like, you, know, you know, it's funny. It was horrible. You, you, me- you mentioned that. I had the exact same situation in the next round when the Indians went up 3-1 and we had the one home game left. Yeah. And it was Josh Beckett against CeCe. I had my biggest customer... Had has this vendor expo every year, and it was that night in Chicago, and I absolutely could not miss it. It was my account, and I couldn't miss it. And I'm like, how the hell we could win to go to the World Series in my home park, and I can't be there. Not only can I not be there, I couldn't watch it. But and they ended up losing badly. Uh, but I, for guys like me and you <laughs> to have to miss playoff games because of. You know, work. I mean, give me. Well, I mean, it, it oh, got. God, it was I just recall I zoomed through that post. I mean, again, it's preseason basketball, so I zoomed through the post game right. as best I could. I zoom home, uh, and I didn't live too far. And um, yeah, that get by the way, that game seven, that game five, you missed. Uh, the Red Sox beat a seven to one. That's when uh, CC yeah. got lit up by Euclid. 
That was a complete no show by CC. It was, Josh Be- it was Josh Beckett, right? Yeah. For the Red Sox, yeah. But I get home for the end of the game, and that's when Borowski came in. I think I probably got home in like the eighth inning or whatever. And uh, I remember where I was living in, in Royal Oak at the time. And when Borowski, so I couldn't, I couldn't even sit still. Like I'm standing by the TV in the bedroom. My wife's trying to sleep. And, um, when he struck out Posada, I just lost it. I just lost it. Like I was like, ah, ah, you know, and I started smashing my hand, like on the closet door. I woke everybody. It was great. Were you standing in the lobby selling copies? Of my <laughs> <laughs> I was wearing a purple shirt. Oh, good. What's up with okay. uh, what's up with Doctor Ben Hornstein? By the way, what's the latest? Uh, are dentists allowed back in Ohio? What's what's going on? So one of the things that was allowed back was dentists, believe it or not. And you know, I got to give Doctor Ben and the Center for Advanced Dentistry a serious, serious props because earlier in the week uh, he sent out a series of emails to his patients talking about the steps he was going to take. And I was so impressed. I just want to read you a couple of the protocol that's going to be going down at the Center for Advanced Dentistry at CLE uh, Beachwood on Twitter and uh, CFAD.net on the internet. He said, we are reserving some of our early appointments for our patients who are over the age of 60 and patients who are at high risk because of health factors causing decreased immunity. All patients will go through a forehead temperature scan and a thorough history of questions pertaining to their health status and social distancing, and they are staggering patient visits to maintain social distancing. Therefore, when you have a schedule appointment, you will call them from the parking lot, and they will bring you into a treatment room and directly there, which is great. And they're really doing their best to, to make you feel at ease. I'm telling you, I, I was so impressed by this, setting up a barrier look at, in the look treatment at this room. guy for patients that are needing dental filling work and are also purchasing high-speed suction units for all procedures. They're, they want you to wear masks when you walk in for your safety, uh, for the safety of yourself and other patients. They're going to be wearing masks, shields, disposable gowns that they will dispose of when they're done. And here's what's great, and my favorite thing in the email. Unfortunately, we will not be able to offer hugs and high fives. Maybe a cup of coffee to go if time allows. <laughs> so your appointment is as safe and time efficient as possible. I mean, this guy's the best, okay? Dr. Ben Hornstein, the lead sponsor on this podcast, God bless him, the Center for Advanced Dentistry. When they reopen on May 1st and you need a dentist and your teeth are disgusting because you haven't seen your dentist in a while, go see my man. He'll check, he'll, he'll take great care of you. Dr. Ben Ornstein and the Center for Advanced Dentistry, CFAD.net. By the way, uh, how, how do we have all this 07 talk and talk about the Midge game and everything else and not mention the winner of game two of the ALCS? <laughs> Thomas Masney. What a what a classic. <laughs> that guy rules. First, you know, it's funny. We were talking about the, uh, the bullpen the other day of, of 07. So you forget, like, everyone remembers that Rafi, that Rafi left and Rafi right and Borowski was the closer, but and Jensen Lewis pitched the seventh. But you forget the other guys out there, including Mashley and the great who, – okay, who is the second left-handed reliever on that team? On our team? Yes. Jeez. Uh, I, I forgot, and then I saw his name listed the other day. It game. wasn't Al Mormon in 07. No, it was not. Al Mormon was the a lot was earlier. 97. Yeah, a right. lot earlier. <laughs> uh, the other no lefty cheating. reliever in yeah. 07? Two left-handed relievers. He only pitched when we were losing. Uh, it was somebody horrible. It wasn't Derek Aaron Lillick. Aaron Fultz. Oh, yeah, Aaron Fultz. Sure. Yes, Aaron Fultz. It's a bit of a sidewinder. Yeah. Wow, that's a great call. But yeah, Masney in that game two, when he came in in extra innings, and he struck, he came up, and, and I think it was the it was the tenth inning. It was the came tenth back inning. Around, yes, and we were out of our good relievers. Correct. And he had to come in, and it was Euclid, Ortiz, and Manny, or was it Ortiz, Manny, and Lowell? I think it was Ortiz, Manny, and Lowell. He had to face, and we were like, "Oh my God, how the hell is?" Tom Masney going to get out of this. Right. And earlier in the game, Manny and Lowell both had homered. Fausto was out by like the fifth inning. Like he and Schilling got rocked, both of them. It's a high-scoring game. Ravi Perez got lit up in that game, too. 
Uh, I think you're right. I think yeah, we'd be. I'm looking, and we, I'm looking at the box score right now. We lit up. Uh, uh, we lit up Eric Gagne, if I recall. Yes, we did. He was the losing pitcher in that game. But then the icing on the cake was when they brought Lester. When they brought Lester in, and Gutierrez just smashed one over the wall. Grand slam off of John Lester. Isn't that crazy, Frankie G? And look, John Lester still pitching, and he was, you know, we saw him again, 2016. Unfortunately for yeah, us, we no. saw him again in 2016. That was the last show. <laughs> yeah, we don't need to talk about that again. Oh man, I, not, I do not want to reason with that again. Too good. All right, we got about forty-five minutes in, man. I think we're, uh, I think we're good. It was, it was a fun, fun talk. What else are they showing? Uh, like on ST? I mean, they got to be. I mean, they, are they, they running out of stuff? Show- running out of games? No, uh, they're they're showing a lot. Of, you know, the the play. They, they're not showing World Series games. They can only show playoff games. I've seen that they were doing back to backs game one and two of the Red Sox series. We're on this week. Um, I haven't seen the Toronto games yet. I'm sure those will be run at some point. Um, and then obviously, the, you know, they've shown the 97 All-Star Game and they showed uh, the oh, last year's All-Star Game when Shane Bieber was the uh, MVP. So, you know, they, when, when they have new stuff, they promote it, but then they, you know, they obviously STO needs the content, so they're playing it a ton. And, oh, by the way, Josh Barfield was on the playoff roster because he pinch ran in game two for Travis Hafner. Was Shopik the backup catcher? Is that right? Oh, the shop back? Yes, he was. Mm. He was great, by the way. He had a good he had a good bat bat flip once in a while. I think he had a walk off either Grand Slam or walk off homer against somebody that year. I know he did because I there was that famous picture of the team all waiting for him at home plate. You remember that? It was like Garco, they were all smiling. Grady. I know you know what I'm talking about. Wasn't he Paul Bird's like personal catcher? Or no? Am I am I mistaken on that? Well, let's see if let's see. Well, there's no way they would have sat Victor in the playoffs. I was going to say let's see if. Uh, so Paul Bird won Game Four, right? Or Game yes, five? Game yeah, Four, he, Game Four, the ALCS. Yes. Yeah. So let's see. And Game Four of the ALDS. Yeah. Too. You know what? Man, you are good. He caught Game Four. They. How, how about Wedge not play? Oh, Victor played first base. That's. Yeah. All right. Victor was playing first. And shop it caught, and uh, Bird was the starting pitcher. You and I, I did we see the out? Oh no, I was a Jeremy Bilski sat in the outfield. I did, I did for, I did for Game oh, was, Three. So it was me and you in the outfield for Paul Bird no. against the Red Sox. No, I was in, I was in the outfield uh, with uh, with Heather for Game Three. We came in for that one for the Jake Westbrook game. Okay, I was in the outfield with Bilski for for Game Four. Bird pitched five innings. Jensen Lewis for two. Raphael Bancourt for two. They beat Tim Wakefield. We got outscored. We got outscored twenty three to four in the last two 19, games. 19, <laughs> Nineteen and eleven. Oh my 7, god! Twelve and eleven. Oh my lord! Oh, brutal. I'm no math major, but that's thirty to five. We lost those last three games. <laughs> Yikes! God, CC was such a bum in that series. Just a bum. Ugh. You know, I will I will give CC credit on one thing. He he has said consistently in the last you know five years at least that his biggest regret was not winning World Series in Cleveland. And he you know blames himself for not pitching better in those playoffs. And the one thing he wanted to do so badly was was win it here. I thought, by the way, the year that we got Andrew Miller and CC was still like that was when he, before he started signing one year contracts with the Yankees. I thought maybe that they were going to trade him to the Indians at the deadline and he'd you know, come and be the fifth starter and retire, which would have been a cool thing. I think I will um, retire. I think that would have, would have been a cool thing. Yeah, no, I mean, he, he, is a, he is a legendary Indian and he had his moments and certainly was, was hyped big time and kind of lived up to it and was our was an all-star for a while, but I just I have a hard time still not getting over 07. And then he got his ring with yeah. the Yankees. I get it. I get it. And he's a class guy, very classy. Yeah, listen, he's a great guy, great in the community. You know, they he's, he's beloved. He's going to be in the Hall of Fame. I mean, he's, you know, one of the most successful left-handed pitchers. I mean, look at his longevity. And also, number one, he, he won he won the World Series MVP, right? When they, when they won the World Series that year? I think he was World Series MVP. And what he did in 08 in carrying Milwaukee 
to the playoffs. You remember, they were throwing him out there on three days rest, and he was pitching nine innings, like, for a month. Like, that would never happen today. Mm. No guys, and, and no. he never broke down, really, either, if you think about it. Crazy. Yeah. All right, man. Well, uh, that was fun. Like fun it is. Ah, all right. That's another edition, ladies and gentlemen, of the uh, Dairy Brothers uh, Tribecast, brought to you by WaitingForNextYear.com. That's where you find us, of course. Uh, please uh, review the podcast if you want on Apple Podcasts. Leave a review on iTunes. Subscribe. Thanks to Raising Canes. Thanks to Dr. Ben Hornstein, the Center for Advanced Dentistry. We'll do it again soon.